Good morning. Today, we're going to enter the Middle Ages, and we're actually going to stay in the Middle Ages for the rest of the semester. We'll be covering early medieval art, Romanesque art, and Gothic art, and all of the different things with which that entails. You see before you an old map. You can see this says USSR on it. That shows how old it is. But circled in the red line is the area that we're going to be concentrating on for the rest of the semester. So the early medieval period that I'm going to lecture on today goes from 500 CE to 1100 CE. It's going to encompass early medieval art, early Christian art, the Carolingian era under Charlemagne, and also the Etonian era. So here's a little bit closer view of this map. And we're going to enter Russia a little bit. We're going to start out up top, up in, you can see Ireland, England, and Wales. And then the very top of Spain is where the earliest medieval art will be concentrated. After that, we'll move through England into what is now Germany, Belgium, and France and eventually down to Italy, just for Langobard, Italy. But mostly we're going to be concentrated for this part of the lecture in Northern Europe. So what is the Middle Ages? Sometimes you might think of knights in shining armor, princesses in castles, crenellated bastions, tubs of boiling oil poured down on unwary besiegers. These are all things that happened during the Middle Ages. And years ago, they actually referred to parts of the Middle Ages as the Dark Ages, meaning that it was a time of no learning, of just darkness, that we didn't know anything about it, that it must have been a very barbarous time. Over the past several decades, scholars have found that contrary to what they believed before, there was actually rich complexity, rich innovation. A lot of things happened during this time between 500 and 1100. Remember, this is also the time of the Crusades, and it's the time of you know, Alfred the Great. You know, there's, if you know much about European history, it's a fascinating, fascinating time. Now, the artwork that was made here was a precursor to Western art as we know it today. So we're going to see sort of a kettle of influences, a cauldron, if you will, with all sorts of things being poured into it. There's three periods, as I stated earlier, the early medieval, which ends in the 11th century, Romanesque period, which is mostly the 11th and the 12th centuries, and then lastly, Gothic, which is the mid-12th to 15th century. During this time, there's a breakdown of the central power of the Roman Empire. There's a growing influence of the church, of course, and we also see a fusion of Germanic, Celtic, and Roman culture. So very complex social structure that arises out of it, and that structure is called feudalism, and I'll explain what all that is in this lecture. So in your book, if you have the fifth edition of the text, chapters 14, 15, and 16 are all discussing this period in European history called medieval. So medieval Middle Ages, they're sort of, they're um, terms that can be substituted to some extent, although they do have particular meanings as well. And really, the Middle Ages is called the Middle Ages because it occurred after Classical Greek and Roman and before the Renaissance period. So it's that in-between time. The word Renaissance actually means rebirth. And of course, we see this flowering in our history survey too in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. We will have a little mini Renaissance called the Carolingian Renaissance during the Emperor of Charlemagne. And if you look in your text, there's a great little um, article called Art in its Context, defining the Middle Ages. So learn more about that in your text. You can study that is what I'm talking about here. The two words in the later chapters, Romanesque and Gothic, refer not only to the time frames, but also the styles. And there's very particular things in the Romanesque style and the Gothic style that differentiate them from each other. And we'll unpack that in the coming weeks. Some time frames, of course, overlap, which is why we look at style as much as we do time frame. 
So this early medieval art is really an art of migrations. And if you remember, we talked about migratory art way back when we looked at Paleolithic art, art of nomadic peoples, people that are not building permanent buildings for whatever reason, they're moving from place to place. However, the difference between the Northern Europeans the Vikings and the hunter-gatherers is that the Vikings, the northern quote-unquote barbarians, had a very complex structure and a very complex pantheon of gods and very beautiful art, very intricate, but it's mostly art of the stuff that they carry around. These people that I'm talking about, they're actually Germanic peoples, and they're the same people that Justinian fought. If you remember, they had these waves of barbarians all the way back third, fourth, fifth century. So these invasions are nothing new, and we have all these different Goths, Ostrogoths, Visigoths in France and Spain, Vandals settling in Spain, North Africa even, and then these people called the Franks that eventually become France and Charlemagne's people. So after the Romans left Britain, these other people, Angles and Saxons, took over from the Celts or the Britons and drove them into Wales. So all these different groups did not know anything about Greek and Roman culture. And they were primarily nomadic. So of course they have clothing, weapons, jewelry, horse gear, things like that is what we're going to be looking at images of here. So here are the cultures that we're looking at. And on the left side are all of the cultures that you've learned about. Christianity, and of course the Christians, they have their one God. They already have a very organized feudal structure in place. If you recall with the establishment of the Catholic Church, the bishops buying up land, large tracts of land owned by the church and the Pope as the head of the church. So they're already socially organized. And they've taken their imagery and mythology from both the Middle East and Rome, as we've seen. We also have Greek and Roman polytheistic traditions, which if you recall, some of these people don't ever become Christian. They perhaps migrate north or establish other cultures. And lastly, we have Islamic art. So all of those cultures are already mixing, but now from the north, we bring a new pantheon of deities, which is a polytheistic structure with a whole new set of gods. Odin, who is their supreme god. We have Thor, who's the god of war and throws bolts of lightning. We have Frigg, who's the goddess of home. We have Freya and Freya for fertility. Loki, who's the god of mischief and fire. So some of them are new. We haven't seen a god of mischief before. That's a northern construct for sure. Some of it is the same, some of it's similar, some of it's different. They believe that there's an ash tree called Yggdrasil that supports the whole universe. And they do also have the fates. The fates are, though, are called the Norns, and they don't sit and spin the way the Greek fates do. So these Vikings who have that pantheon of gods live in the north, and they begin invading back in 200 all the way through into the Carolingian Empire. And after Charlemagne, that empire got divided into three parts, so they started fighting with each other. Once they did that, the, that, that empire was ripe for Viking invasion. So the Vikings have already been attacking the coasts for a couple of hundred years. But once Charlemagne's empire sort of dissolves, it gives them a lot more chance to establish settlements. They were seafarers, and they raided and settled anywhere their ships could sail. And later on, Harold Bluetooth brought Christianity from Europe up to Scandinavia. So all of these happen between the 5th and the 11th century. It's a very brief overview, and each little part could be a whole semester study in itself. But I just want to give you a general idea of what's happening. 
So here's a picture of a Viking ship burial. And what the Vikings would do is they would put their dead into the ship with their hoard. They would, kind of like the Egyptians, they would save up a hoard during their life and then they would put it in the ship and then they'd either sink the ship with the, with the deceased or set it on fire and send it down the river. So this particular ship, this honored two women on their journey to eternity. And the, the size of the ship, the wealth of it is sort of a testament to the wealth of these two women, the prominence of the person that owned the ship. This is a um, purse cover that was found in a ship burial at Sutton Hoo. And it's a good example of this animal style, this Celtic style. So the British Isles and Scandinavia, Britain and Scandinavia, they were never ever part of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire did incur north into southern Britain, but it never really conquered there. And Drayden Warfare brought gold and gems, and their artwork is marked by this animal style, which is generally it's symmetrical. And we have animals that are shown from all different angles. This is a little bit better picture of this. At the backing, of course, is a replacement to it. There were 37 coins inside this thing. And then in the middle, there's two hawks that are attacking ducks. And then on either side, there's men that are spread eagled out between two rampant beasts. And you actually can see some similarities, some similarities in Mesopotamian imagery in the Near East. Up here at the top, you can see this linear design. This is called animal interlace. Also, it's called ribbon interlace. And all these little tiny compartments, they take gold and they twist the gold all up and they put um, jewels and little pieces of glass. It's called millefiori or thousand flower glass and put it all together into a pattern, into a design. So it's absolutely beautiful. This is the animal style all different perspectives for these animals. At any rate, if you look at the imagery on this purse cover, it's really interesting to me how similar these images of these spread eagled men are with the images at the top of this bull lyre. Now we know for a fact that these two cultures did not interact, but I think it's a testament to the human consciousness that somewhere there is in the psyche these all of these archetypal creatures or archetypal images that come out in different artwork globally throughout cultures in different ways. I think it's really interesting. So I wanted to share that with you. We see this animal style in the metalwork as well. This is called the Gumer Smark brooch. And again, we can see these animal and human forms on it. And it's pretty big. It's five inches tall. There's a man compressed between two dragons just below the bridge element. And then they have a pair of dogs down on the tip of the foot plate. He's got, they've got spiraling tongues. So I put in question mark Cerberus. So if you remember back to Greek and Roman mythology, there was a dog um, at the entrance to Hades named Cerberus. Uh, Many-headed dog. So again, are th are these archetypes universal? What did they um, have some sort of um, meeting? You know, we don't know, but it's interesting to see similarities throughout these cultures. We have a very very interesting combination of abstract geometry and this intricate animal style here. And really, for most of this portable art, animals are the primary subject. This is an eagle brooch. And again, it's this cloisonné technique with the millefiori glass and gemstones. We have this stylized geometry, curvilinear designs, and we're going to see this over and over again when we start looking at manuscript illumination. Again, that's why we're looking at this first. These are all the things that these Christian artists, these monks, would have come in contact with when they began populating Europe. This is a hinged clasp. It's from the same burial that that purse cover was from in Sutton Hoo. And down below it, this is a diagram that somebody drew out of the intricate interlace that you can see around the outside of the shoulder clasp. They would wear these, they would have a, 
a rectangular garment. They would wear these clasps to hold the two pieces of cloth together. We also see this kind of interlace and marking on their rune stones. So they did have writing. Um, the Vikings had 16 letters in their alphabet, but unlike the Greeks and the Romans or even the Mesopotamians, writing was strictly, strictly reserved only for a select few priests. So if you remember in Ur, they had tablets where they recorded commercial transactions, things like that. In Greece and Rome, we have philosophers, we have historians. We don't see so much of that here. It's an oral tradition rather than a written one. But they do have this writing that's reserved for these ceremonial stones. They also have picture stones, and you can see the interlace around the outside of this. There's a warrior riding the eight-legged horse of Odin into Valhalla, which was their idea of heaven, and they had Valkyries in heaven. He's The Valkyries extending a drinking horn, saying, welcome to Valhalla, where you will drink and be a hero for eternity. And then on the lower register, we have a Viking ship. So it's probably a reference to a ship burial because it was filled with warriors. So perhaps they died in battle. As far as portable objects go, here's an ax probably from a chieftain, given the fact that it's gold and silver inlay. And you can see again, this very elaborate interlaced style on the, on the blade of the ax. We also th think that they're probably familiar with Anglo-Saxon metalwork because it's geometry as well as interlace. So those are just a few of these Viking Anglo-Saxon objects that would have existed in the country that the church now enters. So now we're going to turn to the Christian church and talk about the Christian church in relationship to medieval art and times. So the church is the central repository of learning. And this, this is for several millennia, it is. It's there, the patron of the arts. They're the center for all art and culture. And so Patronage, of course, means who's paying for the art. The focus of their patronage is the buildings, uh, liturgical equipment, so things for having the ceremonial, things like altars, books, altar vessels, crosses, things like that, candle, candlesticks, reliquaries where they kept the bones of the saints. And monasteries begin to appear in Southwest England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland in the fifth and sixth centuries. And of course, Ireland is first, and we have the earliest monastery in Ireland at the beginning of the 5th century in, in 400. Some are inaccessible, others interact with the communities, and the inaccessible ones, of course, remain preserved intact. They developed independent liturgical practices. Now, in 597, Pope Gregory the Great sent St. Augustine to Britain. The, the, there was a disconnect for a couple of hundred years between the Irish monasteries and the Roman Catholic. The Irish monasteries were autonomous. They wanted to do their own thing. They really didn't have anything to do with the Pope. There was a conflict between the Roman Christian Church authorities and the Irish monasteries, but of course the Roman Church triumphed, whether might is right is a question. Local traditions dominated, however, even though the Roman Church triumphed. and. So throughout all this, the Christian church develops this elaborate monastic system. It's designed to support and educate and house people that dedicate their whole lives to serving Christ in the church. So we're going to look at a little bit of that over this next lecture. So these are just some general things about monasteries. They, they stress a very simple life placed on prayer and manual labor. They needed books, of course, so if you don't have any books, what do you do? You have to make a book, and your book has a page on it about the medieval scriptorium, which talks about the elaborate and time-consuming methods used by these monks to create these books and the bookmaking in the Christian monasteries. The two primary books that these monasteries made are just the Gospels and the Psalters, because think about it, it's going to take a long time to copy out the entire Bible. Not to say that they didn't, but for the most part, they concentrated on making Gospels or making Psalters. 
So here's your vocabulary. The art of making books is called manuscript illumination. Illumination means they're illuminating or lighting, if you will, the manuscript with painting, beautiful color, imagery. And then the manuscript is a handwritten book or document. So usually there'd be a, a monk that would be doing the copying and another monk that would be the artist, the illustrator. So we're gonna start in Christian Ireland. Ireland is Christianized by St. Patrick. You've probably heard of him. We still celebrate St. Patrick's Day in 432 CE. So that is only 100 years after Constantine legalizes the Christian church. So not very long. And so we can see that these Christians are proselytizing right away. For whatever reason, St. Patrick went, and you can read the story of St. Patrick. It's pretty interesting. But at any rate, the Anglo-Saxon conquest of Britain in the 5th and 6th centuries, remember those Angles and Saxons that we talked about a minute ago? They cut Ireland off from the main continent. So these Irish monasteries are really isolated, and they develop a very unique form of monasticism for a couple hundred years before they emigrate to the mainland. So we're going to look at artwork from Duro, Kells, and Iona, and a very individualized style of manuscript illumination. It's got Celtic roots, so you're going to see this, this animal interlace in these manuscripts. And then, of course, later on, Irish missionaries travel. So that's how this interlaced style gets to scriptoria on the continent. So the Irish are called Hibernians. They're the spiritual and cultural leaders of Western Europe. They were never, ever part of the Roman Empire. And the institutional framework of the Roman Catholic Church wasn't suited to the rural Irish way of life at all. They followed the way of desert saints who left the temptations of the city. They sought perfection in the solitude of the wilderness. They do not want anything to do with all of this ritual, this panoply, these great cities. They just want to live their own lives quietly. So these early groups are founding these monasteries and their roots are in these desert saints that are leaving the life of the city behind. So in Ireland, the monks took over the leadership of the church from the bishops. So that's important because it changes what their focus is. So here's an overview of the Gospel Book of Doro. This is made in, uh, this is now in Iona in Scotland. And it was created in the year 675 with in contempora on parchment. So Gospels usually typically would rest on the altars of churches and they're, of course, produced by monks in scriptoria. So I'll unpack these for you. So this is the page with man from the Gospel Book of Duro. And the man, of course, is the symbol of St. Matthew because St. Matthew traces the lineage of Christ in the first chapter. So notice the animal interlace patterns that reflect the interlacing on that axe or on the outside of those rune stones. Also, notice the way the man is drawn, almost as if every little jewel-like bit of color echoes the jewels in those cloisonne jewelry that we saw. We can also see the Celtic stone carving. We can see the animal interlace and, of course, the jewel-relic forms that we saw on the Sutton Hu first cover are all evident here. Okay, the last book that I want to look at from Ireland is the Book of Kells, the Book of Kells, which is really the climax of the Irish manuscript style. So this is called the Giro page, and it's really the name of the place where the name of Christ appears for the first time in a religious text, which is interesting. Um, the church is, what, three, four hundred years old now, but now they're writing down the word Christ, Chi Ro, which is abbreviated as XPI, which are, of course, the first two letters of the word Christos. So here is a detail, and there's so many details in this. They're all embellished with ribbon, animal interlace, all sorts of geometric patterns, Celtic knots. 
And then you can see all over, like little, if you look there, coming out of the line, we've got the, coming out of the stem of the letter, we've got these faces peeking out, all sorts of angels, animals, all interspersed among these motifs. So you can take a magnifying glass and spend quite a little time finding so many different details in these. So here's a detail of cats and mice with the host, which of course is the symbol of the body of Christ. They're fighting over the host and then there's two cats stepping on their tail. There's also other animals in the Book of Kells. There's a fish, which is a symbol of Christ. There's an otter, which there's a legend that an otter came down, the Irish monks would get up in the morning and they would go down to the river and a otter, a black otter, would bring them a fish every day. This is the Tunc Cruciferon, also from the Book of Kells. We can see the T stretching into the legs and claws of a lion, and then its head, of course, is part of the border, and the gaping jaws are ejecting this stream of interlacing. So the purpose here is to il illuminate the Word of God. The fish, of course, is an early symbol of Christ, symbolizing Christ's role. And then the interlacing is echoed into this formal assimilation of iconography. So the iconography becomes codified by the way in which the monks are using local symbols and Christian symbols together. Once this style goes to Britain and later out into the continent, we start calling it Hiberno-Saxon, Hiberno for Irish, Saxon for the Saxons. These illuminators kept the symbols of the four evangelists because it was easy for them to translate these into their ornamental style. And of course, these symbols come from the revelation of St. John the Divine, and the symbols were assigned by St. Augustine. So if you're interested in that, you can that's, there's your references to read about that. So again, this is the Gospel of St. Matthew. Here's the man, and you can see the interlace all around him, and he's seated holding a gospel. Here's the symbol of St. Mark in the Hiberno-Saxon style, much more simplified. We have this sort of curvilinear sense of movement and balance. This Hiberno-Saxon style is found in monasteries that are founded by Irishmen who went to Saxon England. And again, the origin is Celtic abstraction based mainly on plant motifs, although as we'll see, there are some scholars that look at it a little differently. This is a good representation of an early Irish manuscript style. So this is another illustration. These are called the Lindisfarne Gospels. So again, these Irish monasteries are centers of learning. They're centers of the arts, and the art is absolutely beautiful, as you can see. These manuscripts are sacred objects, and the contents is important. So the beauty reflects how important these contents are. This style, it's a Christian form that's evolving from Celtic Germanic art. So they're taking all of their talent and all of their knowledge, and then they're bringing it to the word of God. That's how they saw it. Now, there's a historian named Thomas Cahill, an American. He says that it's a syncretic amalgamation from both classical and Celtic roots. He says that there's animal interlace that's poured into a geometric frame, and in in his tract, he outlines an, I, I, a hypothesis that they had rules, that they had to keep the organic and the geometric shapes separate, and that within the animal compartments, every line had to be a part of an animal's body, and that there was a whole very, very complex system of rules that governed this maze-like illumination. So they, they had codified sit systems written down where they learned how to do this. And according to Cahill, it comes from organic abstractions from plant motifs, and he in a very complicated manner, trace this all the way back to Etruscan artists and the vegetal style from Greece and Rome, which, again, if you're looking at evolution of styles, it's very interesting to think how styles could be brought by different people and then transformed into different different 
imagery and iconography and that's the beauty of art history is there's so many historians and so many you can you can do a whole spend a whole semester on your graduate thesis outlining the origins of animal interlace here we see it on a stone cross and there were a lot of stone crosses erected in the 8th century in the, on this one, we have a circle that's holding the arms of the cross in, that universal circle, symbol of God, symbol of perfection. It's modeled on metal ceremonial or reliquary crosses is where it comes from. And then outlined with this gadrooning, which is this convex molding, almost like a rope around it. So that's what we have for northern early medieval art. And the next thing we're going to look at is Christian Spain.